<laughs> so good evening everyone and welcome to another Sheffield Libraries event and in fact the first in our wild summer program of activity which includes author talks, poetry and story walks, reading challenges, family activities and lots more. So keep your eyes peeled on our Eventbrite page on our social media and maybe sign up for our mailing list to hear more about those things as details are announced. So my name is Dan Marshall, I'm a librarian with Sheffield Libraries and tonight I'm delighted to be joined by journalist and author Joe Shute. Joe's latest book, Forecast, A Diary of the Lost Seasons, is on here, it's actually published today, so we're double lucky to have him with us. And while I remember, if you would like to read Forecast after watching this, and I highly recommend it, then get yourself down to Rhyme and Reason Bookshop at Hunter's Bar, where they have signed copies. I'll give them a call and I'll post one out to you. Now, the format of the evening is pretty simple. Joe and I are basically just going to have a chat but we'd love it if you out there in the audience got involved too. So if you have a question, type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, somewhere down there, and I'll do my best to put it to Joe on your behalf. Okay, so Joe, welcome. It's great to have you here. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. In the age of COVID, this is the closest I get to a book launch, in fact. <laughs> well, I thought I'd just position copies around my kitchen. And, yes, strategically uh, placed there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's, it's great to have you, especially on the, the day the book's launched. Shall we begin with you just telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, your, your life as a writer, as a journalist, about your writing generally? Sure. So I'm, uh, uh, I'm currently work as a feature writer at the Daily Telegraph. Um, I've been a journalist for uh, coming up to 15 years now. Um, started my career up in Yorkshire. I was a trainee reporter at the Halifax Evening Courier, as it was then, sadly now a weekly paper, and uh, worked there for a couple of years, and then moved on to the Yorkshire Post. Um, I started there as their Yorkshire Dales correspondent, which was about as good as it gets in journalism, I think, and uh, moved, spent a few years doing that, and then uh, became their crime correspondent um, before joining the Telegraph, moving down to London uh, in, at the end of 2012, it was. Um, I moved back up to Sheffield four years ago and uh, have, yeah, been here ever since. Um, and uh, yeah, I sort of, this is my second book. My first one is called A Shadow Above and it's the story of uh, the raven and how it's kind of woven into uh, human society and how we sort of have this relationship with the bird. This book, uh, Forecast, which, as you say, is here in a beautiful cover show in Stanage in, uh, in the Peak District, which is uh, all about the weather. And I guess the basis for it is um, almost ever since I've been at the Telegraph, I've written the Saturday Weather Watch column, which is uh, just a, a, a small sort of item, just a few hundred words, really, uh, on the back page of the Saturday paper. Um, I've written it for uh, about eight years now uh, and when I was first given the column my, my sort of slightly cryptic instruction from my editor was to write about anything but the weather which seemed kind of strange for uh, a, a column that's entitled Weather Watch. I soon sort of took that to mean really that it's kind of writing about the folklore of weather and our sort of relationship with the weather particularly in Britain this unique relationship we have uh, with the weather that sort of assails us on all sides um, and it's also for compared to anything else I write for the paper it's by far what I get the most correspondence about. I've got this stack uh, of literally hundreds of letters I've been sent over the years by Telegraph readers uh, about the column and telling me about their own sorts of observations of the weather, their own experiences of the weather and particularly in recent years, how the weather is changing in unfamiliar ways around them and how that is sort of leading to seeing uh, flowers coming up at the wrong time and birds either arriving or disappearing that weren't there previously. And really that gave me the, the basis of the idea for the book. Yeah, I, I guess the foundations were there, weren't they? You got all that material and I mean, when you, when you set out to, to write the book, um, I mean, did you did you have a pretty fixed idea of where it was heading, what you were going to be exploring, where it would be taking you, or, or was it more organic than that? And were there any surprises? I wanted it to be a book that sort of brought home for people living in 
Britain, the reality of climate change. And to sort of illustrate how climate change was already changing our everyday, how, you know, we think of, of, of it um, as a sort of abstract thing in some sense, climate change that's happening elsewhere, hits kind of other parts of the world and uh, isn't maybe something that is, is, is changing our lives. And I sort of wanted to show in the book that, that, that it is very much so. And not just through the extreme weather events. As a, a journalist, I've um, uh, covered, you know, all sorts in, in the last decade or so, kind of once in a century floods that um, are now happening every couple of years in Yorkshire and uh, the Calder Valley and, and, and more recently in Fish Lake in Doncaster um, a couple of years ago where there was the, the terrible flooding there before Christmas. Uh, covered wildfires. I was on the scene of the Saddleworth Moor fire um, in 2019, 2018, I think, which was the uh, biggest wildfire in, in, in living memory at the time. So you've got these sort of extreme weather events, but then also as I was sort of seeing through the, the letters that I was being sent and also, you know, just talking to, to, to experts in the field, is the way that the climate change is changing our sort of everyday seasonal pattern as well. And that was really sort of um, trickling down into the natural world. Um, so I wanted it in a way to be a bit of a sort of detective story, really, going back to my old crime correspondent days of kind of piecing together these clues in nature and sort of presenting them as, 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 as yeah, of, of, of actually what climate change is doing. Yeah, I find it really interesting, actually, how you managed to combine both the, the sort of ecological side of it, but there's a social side and you know, a psychological side, and it, it affects things like language and identity. And we'll talk about all these things later, of course, but there's so much in book. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was brilliant, really, and uh, a fascinating, yet really quite, you know, this heavy stuff, but this is very accessible and, <laughs> and very familiar. Um, it's cracking read, cracking read. Thank you. You you've spoken a little bit about some of the places you've been in the course of your your journalism and research in the book, but can you tell us a little bit more about some of the people you met, places you went, thinking you know you were any sure and and Bradwell and you went to Spur, but you were you were overseas and lots of other places locally and further afield as well. Yeah, I wanted it to be much like my last book, The Raven Book, was a sort of a journalistic book above all else. I wanted to do the same thing with, with forecasts as well, which was kind of, you know, traveling around the country and meeting, uh, meeting people, getting their own experiences of the weather. Going back to those letters um, from readers, I always found them sort of very kind of moving when it's someone's own experiences, someone who's maybe had a garden for you know 30 40 50 years recounting those experiences you get so much more of them because you get you kind of get that emotional attachment to change as well um so yeah i mean i traveled up and down the country and and um uh you mentioned renishaw hall that's um uh for, for people who don't know that's a, a stately home just outside of sheffield just in derbyshire um only a few miles away though and uh it was um back in the 60s or the 70s, it was the most northerly vineyard in the world. And there was a guy who owned the hall at the time called Sir Raresby Sitwell, which I always think is a fantastically posh name. And uh, he owned uh, a vineyard in Chianti in, uh, in, in Italy as well, and tried to introduce the same thing on the Derbyshire, Yorkshire border without much success and sort of grew this um, uh, this horrible wine that kind of staff dreaded drinking every Christmas when he'd uh, invite them into the house for a drink. But because of climate change in recent decades, that wine is actually not just becoming very drinkable, but starting to win awards now as well. And they can even um, uh, make red wine there now, which would have been completely impossible just a few years ago. Uh, so I went there and joined the uh, harvest there um, for, for, for the uh, the grapes in September and met the, the guy Kieran who was running um, uh, the vineyards and, and, and some of the volunteers as well. You know, but one of the most sort of affecting interviews I had there actually was just one morning after I'd finished the, um, the harvest and wandered into the gardens. They've got these lovely sort of landscape gardens that are open to the public and just sort of started chatting to the head gardener there who was on his break. Um, and when I told him a, a bit about the book and so on, he had been there for 20 odd years and he started telling me about the changes he'd seen in that garden over that period. Um, 
their crocuses, for example, uh, would always appear in February. And he said in recent years, they now appear before Christmas. Similarly, they'd have a bluebell fortnight at the end of April, um, but now that had changed to the beginning of March. Um, and these little sort of, um, he said he was kind of terrified by what he was seeing. And I remember him saying, you know, if this is happening here, what's it like on, on, on the edge of the world, you know? And uh, yeah, it was sort of very affecting to know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, when you when you look at these the patterns, you talk about patterns in the book. You give lots of examples. It's, it's blinding. It's striking. It's 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 there, and it's obvious to see that you know, this is a thing. Um, did you meet any sort of climate change deniers in the course of your travels as well? I mean, I think like this spring, actually, the books come out in a year where actually it, we, it was a bit of an anomaly. I suppose we had tulips flowering in our garden in June, which was weird and. Everything yeah. seemed to be a little bit behind where it usually would. But of course, when you look at the patterns over time, that's a bit of a freak occurrence. Yeah, a freak occurrence, which also climate change is making um, yeah. more uh, likely to happen as well. You know, it can, it can work both ways. I, I didn't meet any uh, climate change denies for the book, but I've had plenty of encounters over the years writing my column. And uh, actually, as this book has started to come out, the Telegraph magazine uh, serialised it a few weeks ago. And uh, after that appeared, I found myself on a few um, climate change denial blogs, um, sort of uh, saying exactly that, you know, how could, what, can, what can this guy be talking about? We've just had a really cold um, spring and uh, <laughs> it's all nonsense kind of thing. Um, but I think that's a lot less now, you know, compared to when I first started writing this column, uh, the political consensus has mm. changed massively. Um, I remember being uh, on, in, down south in a place called Beaudley that flooded just before Christmas back in 2013, maybe. And uh, it was when David Cameron was prime minister. And uh, it was a kind of awful, as a journalist, it was the, the commission that you dread on Boxing Day. This village flooded. My editor rang me up in the morning and said, you've got to go down there. And it was kind of total sort of carnage down there. All these poor villagers have been sort of rained out, flooded out for uh, over Christmas and stuff. And, uh, and I remember Cameron turned up in that classic sort of politicians in wellies type thing and started pointing at things. But he said then, he said, um, this seems to be something, because that was a real once in a century flood that had happened twice in, in a few years. And he said, this seems to be something that's happening, you know, with increasing regularity. And even that, I mean, that sort of anodyne statement was kind of big news at the time because, yeah, I mean, they just weren't, politicians weren't acknowledging it in, uh, in the way that they are now. The issue now is, as we've seen in the news today with the Climate Change Committee urging the government to do more, is they're acknowledging it and saying they're going to do stuff and setting targets in the future, but actually not doing much to, in terms of putting that into practice. Um, the kind of urgency isn't, isn't there yet yeah yeah let's talk about the seasons and the idea of them shifting and changing or, or maybe even disappearing to an extent um do you think our connection with them is is changing as well maybe being lost yeah i think um i think it's a sort of natural process of um our sort of increasingly urbanized society and the fact that many of us now um, sort of, you know, spend our days, um, as I definitely do, <laughs> behind a computer screen, tapping away. And uh, it's, um, yeah, we don't have that sort of, our, our real sort of attachment to the season started, obviously, when we were a very agricultural society and the seasons quite literally were a matter of life and death for people that's really how this sort of incredible kind of treasure trove of, of, of seasonal folklore uh, was built up and also this amazing um, seasonal vo vocabulary we had we used to have a really sort of um, diverse weather vocabulary um, that was really sort of split between regions as well and these words were sort of everyday words, which now are only occasionally used. Um, one of them that, that appeared just uh, the other week was Mizzle. And uh, it was when the G7 were in Cornwall and um, Boris Johnson and Joe Biden had planned to go to, uh, I think it's called St. Michael's Mount, which is like a, a sort of 
a, a, a sort of island just off the mainland and they were going to go there at low tide and pose for pictures and stuff and this sort of dense fog crept in from the Atlantic with that sort of really fine rain uh, that led to the trip being cancelled and all the sort of old Cornish sea dog knowing he said ah that's the mizzle coming in and uh, we all have these words in Sheffield there's loads of them as well sort of very precise words for a certain type of weather that you can only get in a certain um, part of the country as well and uh, in Sheffield for example they used to say snitters for that sort of sleety snow that you often get uh, on those kind of cold November days in Sheffield when it doesn't quite snow and it doesn't quite rain a bit a bit of both and uh, yeah we've kind of we're, we're as we sort of homogenized the society and as we've urbanized the society we've kind of lost that sort of attachment and, and some of that vocabulary as well yeah it's a bit tragic isn't it when you think about it all that richness <laughs> you know um I, something that made me smile in the book you talk about eskimos and how many words they famously have for snow and then you kind of compare that to how many words the the british might have for rain or whatever and yeah it's far more many, many, yeah. yeah i think it's over 50 different words for rain the brits have got and that's glorious that's something to celebrate it'd be awful if we lost that <laughs> um Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's part of our national identity, isn't it? And uh, that's that's quite a big deal. Um, okay, let's think about, about it from an ecological perspective then. I mean, does, does it matter if spring arrives a little bit earlier, if, you know, the swallows turn up sooner and bluebells flower a little earlier in April or something? So there's a, a, a science um, that I tried to sort of get into in the book, which is called phonology. And um, it started, uh, I think it was a Belgian um, naturalist who, who, who coined the word, but it really started in Britain in the 18th century um, and still exists today. The idea of it is that you, can, you trace the seasons and you trace the passage of the year through the natural world. So um phonologists um scientists can actually map the progress of spring through things like um the emergence of flowers the emergence of insects when birds first build their nests um when uh when things come out of hibernation that sort of thing and uh, through doing that they can very precisely say when spring arrives it, it begins in the southwest of the country and slowly travels up to the northeast and uh, they think it takes about three weeks now to travel all the way through the country. And it's speeding up. Spring now arrives uh, nine days on average earlier each year um, wow. than, it, than it used to, even though it did a few decades ago. And uh, I think if you go back into the 19th century, it was, you know, a fortnight earlier. Um, so all this stuff is sort of getting jumbled up and everything's speeding up. And to kind of answer your question of whether that matters or not, um, it's speeding up at a rate that um, things like birds and insects have, um, can't keep up with, basically. Um, so what we're seeing is um, uh, flowers coming out um, ever earlier. In, in many cases, they, they call them sort of autumn stragglers, and they're flowers that never really go into hibernation. So things like oxide daisies, particularly as one, well, uh, where they're just sort of going all the way through the year now. And that means insects are hatching much earlier um, to kind of take advantage of those flowers and, and pollinate them and so on. But, but, uh, but birds that would have those insects as prey and have sort of um, developed over, you know, millennia to, uh, to arrive, for example, migratory birds like cuckoos have developed exactly the time of their arrival in Britain for a period of time when there's the most abundant sources of food that are there. If they arrive here and that food isn't there, then it can have a sort of devastating impact on populations. Um, the British Trust for Ornithology released a report in 2019, which estimates now that climate change is having a, a profound impact on about a third of British bird species. Mm. Um, and yes, and so yes, it matters. It definitely matters. Yeah, clearly. Um, you, you talk about spring moving up the country, but in the book you talk about species needing different species, be birds or plants, or whatever, needing to move with the warming climate as well. I suppose in a, a landscape that's already quite fragmented, that's a problem. 
Yeah, there doesn't. So it, the different parts of the country are warming up at different rates. Um, and the southeast of the country is uh, warming up the fastest. Um, and what you're seeing, what we're seeing is this sort of slow sort of shift northwards um, in all species, in, in, in insects in particular. Um, there's been an amazing study done by uh, scientists at York University that studied all these different species of insects and, and mapped them using phonology, mapping them as they move up the country. So things like comma butterflies, for example, which people might know from, they're those butterflies with sort of serrated edges on their wings. They're designed to look like fallen leaves as a sort of disguise. And they've moved in, in about 20 years from uh, Yorkshire being the northernmost point of their range to Aberdeen now, and they can be found. Um, and in birds, we're seeing it as well. You know, take a, a, the, the ring-necked parakeet is a classic example, um, which is uh, Britain's only naturalized parrot, and so an invasive species and started in the southeast of the country. And now uh, they go uh, all the way up to Glasgow, which has the, the, apparently the most northerly flock of parrots in the world with its parakeets there. In Sheffield, we've got them uh, sort of dotted all over the city and a particularly pronounced flock at the Northern General uh, Hospital where you can, uh, you can spot them there. Because um, it's not all sorts of losers in, in this as well. Um, you know, there are some birds um, that are doing, as, as the weather warms, that are doing increasingly well. Um, things like long-tailed tits, for example, goldcrest, wren, goldfinch, these birds that typically if we're having very cold winters would, uh, because of their size, would suffer very badly. And now they're becoming much more common sites in our gardens uh, through the year. Mm. It's a mixed picture. We actually had an ecologist, I, I chatted with an ecologist, um, an author, a couple of months back now, you can view that on our YouTube channel, and he, he works up in the Highlands and was so excited about common butterflies arriving upon the, the mm. estate where he works, but was equally worried because birds like snow bunting are, you know, quite likely to go extinct in the not too distant future because there's just nowhere for them to go. Yeah, and for a local example for us, the mountain hare is one where yeah. not just climate change, but climate change having a, a severe impact on their on their populations. Yeah, I, I was out walking on um, the Derwent Moors well, in, in the winter and they were obvious, you know, they were bright white and yeah. you couldn't really miss them running across the, the brown moors. Um, We've actually got some questions coming. Let's have a quick look see what we've got. So, Michelle asks, are there any examples of intelligent farming that you admire and feel are working for the present climate? Uh, for example, letting streams find their natural course along farmland, choosing farming types that suit the land instead of draining lower pastures, that sort of thing. Yeah, there's a, a farmer I meet in the book, actually, a man called uh, John Elliott. Um, who farms um, a number of uh, acres around Hathers Edge, so not far from, from Sheffield at all. His family um, go back centuries. Um, he's always farmed that land and they used to, they've always been cattle farmers, which um, uh, obviously, you know, are known for kind of this cattle that is, is one of the sort of bete noirs of, 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 uh, of creating lots of methane emissions and so on. Um, his, uh, John's, I think, uh, great grandfather used to run the, old milk rounds around Hathers Edge and a horse and cart and uh, he's got this sort of amazing local history of it um, and he farms in the old ways he farms um, I've, I first met him actually completely by accident I was cycling through um, the Peak District and just came past one of his fields in, in haymaking time around this time of year actually and he was out uh, on his meadows and uh, with his four sons who were aged about 20 down to about 11. And they each had their own tractor, these tiny little Massey Ferguson tractors. And uh, they were sort of cutting, uh, doing the annual cuts of the meadow. And uh, there were swifts, sort of this great cloud of swifts flying around them and diving down and eating the insects that were coming up from uh, what they were cutting. And uh, John's wife, Sharon, was there and they'd spread out this kind of lunch for the family to have. And I just wandered over and started having a chat with them and uh, got to know him through there and went to see them uh, at their farmhouse a few times. And he sort of, he talked a lot about what he does to, um, to conserve the land. You know, he um, only ever uses very small uh, tractors and machinery. He never adds any fertilizer to the land. Um, 
you know, there's this thing of sort of spreading slurry across um, uh, pastures, which he never does. Um, but he also talked about, you know, the pressures on farmers as well. There's this constant pressure on them to create uh, ever cheaper food for people and the sense of, of being demonized as well. And he could understand why, you know, um, profit margins are so tight that some farmers, you know, um, aren't able to do that. Um, he says, you know, he, he hardly makes any money out of it at all, but he does it totally out of a love for the land, but that's not a sort of luxury that um, everyone can, can be afforded. Um, I mean, to give an example of his love, whenever he goes on holiday, he, Sharon says she can never wrench him away from the farm. But when they do go, they go to a sort of model 19th century farm somewhere in the Yorkshire Dales, <laughs> which is the ultimate kind of busman's holiday. And uh, but he's got um, the, the sort of most beautiful bit of his land, from my perspective, are his ancient hay meadows, which are um, a sort of a vanishingly rare now um, landscape. We've lost over 90 percent of them since the Second World War, as they've been sort of grubbed up. Um, as a result of industrialized farming. Uh, and John still has his, um, as they were, cuts them once a year, which benefits the diversity of the meadows and so on. And uh, he invited me um, uh, the following year after I'd first met him into these meadows just before they were cut and said, you know, this is when they're, they're sort of most glorious. And just come, come and have a look basically. And just walking around, seeing the insect life in there um, and the, 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 the colors, the beautiful sort of, um, different colours of, of the flowers there um, was, uh, yeah, fantastic. It was a lovely landscape. Sounds glorious. John sounds like a bit of a hero. <laughs> yeah. Um, loosely linked, but another question from the audience. So think about landscapes. Uh, Denise writes, Peter Bruegel, an artist from the Netherlands, painted pictures about seasons in the lives of ordinary people in the 16th century. At that time, they had six seasons with an early spring and summer. Have you come across this? No, six seasons is new to me. Um, but I think the interesting thing now that I certainly discovered in the book is um, how quite relatively modern our sort of notion of, of the four seasons is. Um, in Old English, uh, in the Middle Ages, it was still really regarded as two seasons in Britain. You had a sort of six months of light and six months of, of darkness. And it was only, uh, there was a Roman influence. The Romans always um, had sort of a more sort of uh, pronounced idea of four seasons. That slowly kind of trickled into British culture. And uh, there was a big influence from uh, the continent as well um, around sort of 13th century, uh, where you had these sort of French troubadours who would come over to England and start kind of talking about the romance of the seasons. Um, and it was really people like Chaucer, uh, Shakespeare to an extent as well, who started sort of, creating this kind of idealized version of the four seasons um, in our minds. Um, and I think a point I make in the book and a point I, I try and be careful with in the book is it is an idealized version. You know, this kind of idea that we had four perfectly quartered seasons and everything, the weather was always wonderful until climate change came along just isn't true. I mean, if you look at the Little Ice Age, for example, which, um, lasted for hundreds of years. And in the um, uh, 17th century was at its most pronounced, uh, temperatures fell by uh, two degrees and led to sort of widespread famine and uh, political insecurity, riots and, uh, and, and kind of all sorts. You know, the weather's always been a tricky thing in our part of the world as, you know, we've got everything the Atlantic Ocean chucks our way and whatever sort of polar stuff comes from the North. And uh, yeah, this kind of, I'm sort of interested or very interested in the book and that idea of how we sort of um, create this idealised view of the weather and our nostalgia uh, around the seasons as well. Which again, I guess, feeds into the national identity and but also uh, I think how we feel, you know, how we feel when things don't quite work out as we expect them to. I, I have memories of warm mizzle in January. I can't think of much more more depressing than going out in warm rain in January. It's, it's awful, awful. Um, you want crisp, clean air and snow and ice on the ground, but hey, that's maybe a fiction. Maybe you just need to. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of, uh, I think the Victorians particularly, you know, created this idea of the perfect winter and this perfect sort of uh, Christmas scene of, of, of sort of crisp snow and everything else. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of, 
that certainly there's an aspect of that in a, in a British winter, but uh, I think what's clear is it's an aspect that's becoming increasingly unlikely. There was a, a big Met Office report out um, only a few months ago um, that looked at if um, emissions continue to climb at their current rate, uh, what snowy winter is going to look like in, in years to come. And I think by about 2060, uh, across most of England, most of Britain, in fact, snow would be uh, a thing of the past, the report said. Sad thought. Yeah. Um, Joanne in the audience writes, in relation to the six seasons, there's a lovely project at the moment that is building on the Japanese micro seasons, a different season every week, uh, noticing nature, um, the British micro season project is what it's called, noticing nature, British micro season project. So if anyone's interested in that, I guess, um, Google, see what you find. Um, so, as a journalist, you, you know, you've reported on wildfires, on, on flooding, as you, you said earlier, they, they seem to be happen, happening more often and more ferociously and often quite close to home as well. Um, those things take a toll on people. Maybe we could speak a little bit about, about that, and the impact those things, well, you've seen those things having. Yeah, I think particularly where um, I saw that in Britain, at least, was uh, in the um, Coulda Valley, um, not far from here, in uh, uh, around Hebden Bridge, um, which was where, where, as I said at the start, where I started off as a journalist and remember um, flooding happening back then. Um, but in, in the last decade or so, they've been hit three or four times by really serious floods that, you know, kind of wipe out the centre of the town for a time. Shops get completely inundated and have to shut for, for, for months on end. Um, and uh, they've been... Uh, at the same time as sort of doing the traditional kind of cleanups and flood wardens and everything else, what they started to do in the Calder Valley is send um, special trauma teams uh, along to talk to people and kind of help them make sense of these changes that they're seeing in the town. And uh, it's a sort of the, the, the phrase that was coined was environmental trauma. And it's something uh, that, that people were sort of seeing um, for, yeah, sort of helping people to face up to this new reality, basically. Um, but there were lots of sorts of ways that you can rally communities around this as well. They did a, um, after uh, one of the sort of very bad flooding events in Hebden Bridge, they decided to have a community opera that was um, played at the uh, Peace Hall in Halifax, and it was called uh, Waterland. Um, and uh, it got all sorts of, a load of people who'd been flooded out, people who'd been in the sort of emergency shelters, to come together and devise this opera about the fact that the weather was changing and about the fact that we're seeing all this rainfall. And uh, it played over four nights in the Beast Hall and, and kind of really got people together and helped sort of create this community response to it. Um, and we can do that, you know, throughout this book, I sort of, I want it to be a hopeful book and I want it to be a, a book that, you know, can sort of, um, help people think that this isn't just something that happens to us, but it's something, you know, that we can react against and bring people together to, to sort of mitigate as well. And uh, yeah, that was a, a lovely example of that, I thought. Yeah, uh, it is a hopeful book, for sure. Um, that, that really comes through quite strongly, actually, despite some of these terrible things that are going around. There, there are lots of examples of people doing that and responding. And you give you give some of those. You talk about things like, um, I can't remember where it was now, um, but using nature to sort of manage flooding and um, communities planting um, native trees to act as fire breaks and things like that, which were really interesting uh, yeah, human in, stories. Uh, that was in uh, Portugal. In, uh, so um, uh, a few years ago, when Portugal had terrible wildfires in the north of the country um, and uh, that I, I went there to, to write a, a magazine article about it. And um, they'd um, a big cause of the, these wildfires that were just sweeping through were eucalyptus forests. And they'd been a sort of, um, a kind of massive explosion in the amount of eucalyptus trees that were planted because Portugal has got a huge paper industry. It's one of its biggest industries. And these eucalyptus is very fast growing. Uh, so in what were once very sort of mixed, diverse landscapes, you were just getting this sort of monoculture of eucalyptus, which some people watching may know is sort of famous for sucking all the moisture out of the ground. 
and having a very high oil content. So when it comes to wildfires, they're uh, a disaster. I mean, they just sort of, you know, they kind of, this fire sweeps through. Um, but what you were starting to get, and there was one village I visited in particular where to protect themselves from uh, these wildfires, they were um, coming together to plant these sorts of mixed um, woodlands in a sort of circle, a protective ring around the village. Um, and they were using it as a way of sort of uh, creating a new economy for the village um, and uh, growing sort of different fruits and things like cork, oak, which is a beautiful um, uh, 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 Portuguese tree. I'm sorry, just cork, not cork oak tree. And, uh, um, and they were working, you know, there, there'd been these fires and these trees had acted as a fire break. Um, and it did, yeah, it was a kind of novel response to, uh, uh, to something that was, yeah, really inspirational to see. Yeah, I, maybe that's part of the answer. While our national leaders around the world are kind of dragging their heels or struggling to work things out, maybe we need local action. Absolutely, yeah, that's the number one part of the answer, I would argue. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, so talking about local, and, and you mentioned that you uh, have been down south, you moved north and went down south. You, you're you now in Sheffield. You're clearly not from Sheffield. The accent is, is, is London, right? It is, yeah, that's where I grew up. Always but, catching me out. <laughs> but uh, you've been here a while now, and the the book feels really firmly rooted and ground, grounded in Sheffield. Um, Sheffield's almost a character in the book. It comes through so strong. And I, I just wondered if that was, why that was, if it was a deliberate thing. What of your bit? It, it kind of wasn't initially. Um, and then... I think by dint of circumstance, because halfway through writing it, lockdown happened. <laughs> and, uh, previously, I'd been sort of uh, living here, but uh, going down to London for work um, a couple of times each week and uh, sort of just traveling around a lot. My job as a feature writer means like I'm sort of in normal times traveling around a lot. Um, and for the first time since I moved here, I was sort of stuck here, really. And uh, it gave me a real opportunity to, um, to kind of get into, uh, explore the city, get into the, the, the history of the city. And uh, in terms of Sheffield's weather history, it's got a, a fascinating um, uh, load of stories connected to it. I began to notice things, for example, like um, if you come out of Sheffield Station, just over the uh, the main road there, there's some old snow gates, which are these old kind of wooden gates. You'd blink and you'd miss them. They're covered in graffiti now. Um, but back in the day, because you used to get such sort of heavy snowfall in the city, they were used by um, workmen. They would slide them back and just heap the road off and dump it in the river, uh, sheaf the snow to keep the roads um, cleared. They're all sorts of disused now and, uh, and, and some of them have just, uh, or most of them have just gone now. But these sorts of tiny bits of sort of urban uh, heritage I found fascinating. And then there were things like um, the Western Park weather station, uh, which I'd never heard of before, um, but it's one of the oldest weather stations in the country, um, set up in 1882 by um, uh, a, a local man who was the curator of uh, the museum at the time. And uh, it was called Elijah Howarth. And he got nicknamed Elijah the Prophet because he, he, he manned this weather station and uh, could predict uh, what the weather was going to do and sometimes got it right as well. <laughs> and uh, this weather station was set up initially because um, they were having a load of outbreaks of sort of strange diseases around the country. And they wanted to uh, examine whether there was a link somehow between the weather and uh, people's health. Um, but it became a sort of a, a fixture of the city really. And it's been in continuous operation ever since. Um, and uh, so I went there, interviewed um, a, a man called Alistair McLean, who's the uh, Elijah the Howarth's uh, uh, successor. And uh, when he first um, started Alistair about 20 years ago, he, he, he told me that he would have these the original sort of leather bound ledgers that had Elijah's handwriting and he would go out and sort of all kinds of weathers and write down in very sort of detailed, precise notes exactly what the weather was doing that day. It, it's autom automated now, but um, still works in the same way. And just kind of uncovering these little stories really sort of brought uh, me sort of 
closer to Sheffield in a way. And uh, yeah, it was a sort of, um, yeah, by dint of circumstance, but I'm very happy that it, it did work out like that. Yeah, I, you, you definitely sense the affection for the city, which is a lovely thing, you know, to read as someone who, who shares that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, as an incomer, it's definitely there. I love Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, there's something else that really comes through strong in the book is your passion for the outdoors, the natural world, and, and your knowledge as well. Very impressive knowledge of, of natural history. I was wondering where that came from. Has that always been there? Not at all, really. I, I've always sort of enjoyed um, the outdoors and being outside. Um, but as a kid, I grew up in central London, and uh, my family are from, or my dad's side family from Yorkshire. So. Uh, would go up to um, the North York Moors where my granny used to live as a kid and always used to love sort of roaming around on the head of moorlands up there. Um, but aside from that sort of instinctive feel for it, it wasn't really until uh, university in my early 20s where I started actually taking much more of a, a kind of proper interest in nature. Um, friends helped, you know, friends who were... Um, very knowledgeable about birds and so on, got me into bird watching. And from there, it just sort of spiraled really. Um, and I guess the luxury of my job, my favorite thing about my job is the ability to, um, the privilege to go out and talk to experts in their fields about um, whatever it is that they're passionate about. And as I've sort of progressed through my journalism career, I've become much more focused on the environment and the natural world. So I've been sort of able to meet um, these amazing people all over the world who have um, uh, got, you know, kind of monitoring the natural world and their own sort of connection to it. So I guess in a sort of magpie-ish way, like many writers, I've kind of picked that up along the way. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say that's where it comes from. Yeah. It's a pretty life enriching thing to pick up though as you go. It's uh, in many worse things. Uh, kind of linked to, well, definitely linked to natural history, another audience question. And I would urge anyone else to send them in as well if you, if you have a, a burning question. Joel asks, how will the changing seasons impact on proposed rewilding and the reintroduction of species to the countryside, that sort of thing? I mean, it's, um, th there will be, uh, it's sort of when you look at it's something we need to take really into account when you look at uh, the species of trees for example uh, that are get, getting planted now there's all these government targets of trebling the amount of trees that we're, we're going to plant in the landscape to mitigate against uh, climate change but equally there's many species of native tree that aren't going to be able to cope with uh, the um, warmer temperatures uh, that uh, lie ahead for us and things like prolonged period of droughts uh, or um, prolonged flooding, all of which is being made um, more uh, likely by climate change. So it's certainly something that is gonna change, not just sorts of our lives, but also the, 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 the kind of how the landscape looks around us as well. And uh, I've mentioned already things like ringneck parakeets um, and uh, black caps are another one. So even the sort of, even the bird song around us is changing over time. Uh, we think of blackbirds, particularly this time of year, you know, blackbirds are at their beautiful peak singing and uh, they really struggle in, um, uh, when, in periods of drought because they can't dig and uh, they can't get the, 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 the worms um, and so on. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's going to change. It's going to change everything. Yeah, I guess rewilding as, a, as an approach to conservation is relatively new, isn't it? But maybe it's better place to to deal with these things than traditional conservation management because it's, it's kind of letting nature do what it wants so those species that are in the best place to survive those conditions and, and flourish will do that yeah i think so and, and and it can help um with the some of the worst um impacts of of, of climate change as well so uh in the book for example i revisit Saddleworth Moor, uh, one year on from um, the uh, that massive fire there that devastated um, so many hectares of the moor, and uh, there's real work there going on to re-wet the moor at the moment and restore it to its natural state bef uh, before the peatland was drained in the sort of 60s, 70s uh, to um, create sort of funnels for rainwater to go into reservoirs in, in the valley below. Um, and uh, that work is, is not just sort of creating a fire break um, 
and it's really startling. You go when you go up to the moor, uh, when even one year on, you could see the sort of outline of the fire um, and where it had got to. And then there was this kind of line of defense and it was sort of brilliant emerald green, um, I never know, know how to pronounce this, but uh, sphagnum moss, you know, the sort of starry uh, moss that um, they're sort of using to re-wet a lot of the moors. And that acts as a sort of giant sponge and it not just sort of keeps carbon in, but it also acts as a fire break as well. And, uh, and then by doing that, it's brilliant for biodiversity. So they're seeing a load more species of things like crane fly emerging and um, increasing numbers of wading birds as well. Things like golden plover, dunlin, curlew, which are uh, massively sort of decreasing elsewhere on these sorts of landscapes. They're doing really well. So yeah, I think these are really kind of hopeful examples where you can do a sort of rewilding project that boosts biodiversity and helps, you know, kind of um, uh, in, ensure against some of the worst impacts of climate change as well. Definitely think that's the future. Good stuff. Bit of Sheffield humour for you here from, from Martin. As a southerner, are you Nesh? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Um, you close the book, you close the book at the summer solstice 2020. You're on a walk around Stanage, Burbage Edge, places that are going to be very familiar to many people that live in Sheffield and enjoy walking that sort of thing. And we're a year on now. It was the solstice a few days ago. Um, I just wondered, did you do anything to mark it this year? I'm ashamed to say, not in the in the way that I did in the book. So in the book, um, I uh, write about going up to um, Stanage, as you say, right on. Uh, it was it was amazing in the morning. It was about four in the morning. Uh, to, to, to see the sunrise on uh, the solstice and uh, there were families sort of camped out all along that gritstone edge there and uh, it was a beautiful morning you could see the sort of early morning mist kind of rolling off the the, the tops of the edge and uh, when I was there I was, it took me right back to uh, when I just left university and I was cycling with some friends through Denmark at the time and by din uh, just by um, we'd been trying to get to a festival to meet some other friends and we'd run out of time basically so we had to cycle all through the night um, to get there uh, in time for the festival to start. And it coincided just by coincidence with uh, the summer solstice as well. And uh, it was this kind of beautiful morning, this real sort of adventure of a day. And uh, I mentioned it a year ago to the friends that I was there with. And one of them remembered a cuckoo that was calling first thing in the morning as we were sat outside this bakery in some um, you know kind of rural Denmark waiting for, for it to open and uh, we all made ourselves a solemn promise that day that we'd always do something to honour uh, the solstice and, and never stuck to it at all and uh, so I was delighted to do that for the book. Um, this time around I just got back from a few days walking uh, the Pennine Way um, and uh, was relieved to uh, be out of the tops of the moors <laughs> and putting my feet up for a bit. So I didn't, but what I did do was, uh, we've got an elder tree in our garden and uh, the flowers had just come into flower, which often um, happens around this time of year. It's actually a bit late this time of year because of um, the spring that we had. Um, but there's an old midsummer myth that if you stand under an elder tree and look up on, uh, on Midsummer's Eve that you'll see fairies in there. And uh, so I did that. I didn't see any fairies, but I made a delicious cordial out of it. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, brilliant. So I think maybe last question. If, is, is there one thing, you just, there's so much in the book, it's, it's really rich, but if, is there one thing that you hope the reader might take away from reading it? Maybe we shouldn't actually answer that because we want them to read it. It's only come out today, but <laughs> I'll let you decide. My, my one thing, and I've stressed it already, would be, um, would be hope. And in the, in the nearly a decade I've written this weather column, I've always tried to you know, strike an upbeat note in, uh, in, in describing the way the weather's changing and describing what's happening. Because I really feel that if we lose hope, then there's just no point, you know? And no one kind of, uh, it sort of removes that, that willingness to, to try and act and do something and come together and, and come up with solutions and stuff. Um, so as I try and show in the book, you know, things can adapt and things do adapt. We see nature adapting um, in, some instance, in some instances incredibly well to these changes that, that's happening uh, and uh, humans can as well. So really it's to, you know, to, to sort of keep people thinking that 
there is a, a sort of positive future out of this and there could be positive change that comes out of all of this as well. So to not lose sight of that hope. Brilliant. Well, that feels like a good place to bring it to a close. So sincere and, and massive thanks um, to you, Joe. Um, so the book is, is out today, published today. Um, our audience, remember, there are signed copies available at Rhyme and Reason um, down at Hunter's Bar. So do check that out. I honestly can't recommend it highly enough. <laughs> and um, yeah, big thanks to everyone in the audience too, especially those that did send in messages. Next week, I'll be joined by journalist, translator and climber, Natalie Berry. Natalie will be telling and explaining the challenge of translating the true story of Elizabeth Revel's extraordinary climb and rescue from Nanga Parbat, the Killer Mountain in the Himalayas. And in two weeks time, I'll be talking to ultra runner Damien Hall. He'll be telling his own story of discovering running in his mid thirties, only to go on to represent Great Britain, smash the record for running the Pennine Way, and then just a few weeks ago, breaking the decades old record for the coast to coast path too. So that's it. Thanks again, Joe. Good night, everyone. And um, hopefully we'll see you all in the library soon. <laughs>